Good afternoon. Oh, that makes me feel better. I feel the energy now. I want to welcome everyone to today's Tiger Bay meeting. My name is Xavier Bailey, and I am your 2019 president. I would like to call my son, Edward Bailey Jr., to lead us in the pledge. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> He's going to get me for that later. <laughs> I would like to recognize all veterans and any active duty members in the audience. Would you please stand for a round of applause? Any veterans? Thank you so much for your service. I would like to go ahead and recognize our dignitaries and any special guests that we may have. We have Carol Whitmore, which is an at-large county commission for Manatee County. We have Rick Yoakum with Manatee Humane Society. We have Adele Lee Roser with Turn Turning Points. Sharon Hillstrom with Bradenton Area EDC. Bob Blaylock with Blaylock Waters. I keep thinking it's Waters. I don't want to change your name, but it's Walters. <laughs> we have Bill Sanders with the Bradenton City Council. We have Bronwyn Baytal with United Way. We have Jackie Dazelski. I just got it. They told me how to pronounce your name, Jackie. I did it good? Oh, goodness, that's awesome. Manatee Chamber of Commerce. Rosalie Schaefer with the Manatee Women Lead of Voters. And Diana Shoemaker with Manatee County Habitat. Thank you all for attending today. I would like to make sure that all of you turn off your cell phones. This is just a friendly reminder. Thank you so much. Our topic today is growth in Manatee County inevitable? And how do we handle the growth is the real question. Today we're going to have speakers Sherry Corrier, Manatee County Administrator, George Cruz, Principal Pursuit, CRE, Michael Neal, Land Development Manager of Neal Communities of Southwest Florida, Misty Serbia, Manatee County Commissioner, District 4. First, we'll have up Sherry Corrier, the Manatee County Government County Commissioner. Sherry has been the county administrator for Manatee County government since March of 2019. This is Sherry's 30th year in local government. With 26 years in management, she also served as the deputy county commissioner, administrator, department director for neighborhood services, and the first children's services coordinator upon the institution of the children's services tax. She leads a results focused workforce of 1,900 county employees, representing 12 extremely different departments. She manages $1.5 billion county budget and an additional $1.5 billion capital improvement program. 
In May of this year, she was named as the government who's who by the National Neighborhood USA, a 40, a 44 year old organization. In 2012, she received the Tampa Bay Business Journal Business Woman of the Year government category. 2011, the American Association of University Women, Manatee Chapter, making great strides in government winner. In 2009, NAACP Government Humanitarian Award and the 1997 Manatee Community Council for Children Child Advocate of the Year. Please welcome Sherry Corrier. Thank you, Xtavia. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sure speaking on behalf of all the presenters today. Um, as you've heard, I'm the county administrator with Manatee County. You know um, why we're all here is growth. I thought I'd help you a little bit to realize what's been going on to kind of lead into the next three speakers. I went back and did a lot of research for you on how we've grown. So if you just look back at to 1950, there were 34,700 people here in Manatee County back in 1950. In uh, 1980, uh, we had grown uh, to 148,000 people. <clears throat> in 2000, we were at 264,000 people. And then things really got heated up, as you all know. In 2010, we had grown in that 10-year time span from 2000 to 2010 at a rate of about 6,000 people per year for that 10-year span. When we got to 2018, everyone said, the, the, all the statistics said that we were at 385,000 people. But in fact, based on new census figures, folks, we're almost right at about 400,000 people in Manatee County. Here in 2018, uh, we had an astronomical growth. You heard me talking about an average of about 6,000 a year in the 2000 to 2018 range, but just in that 10-year period, or excuse me, just in that period between 2018, we had about a 9,000 a year growth. And we're anticipating that to continue now. It was a surprise to us in the last three or four years, but we're planning for it. So what are we doing from Manatee County? We have about 80,000 more people since 2008. We're focusing in on our operations to all of you as residents. Just to put it in perspective, we have 225 more miles of roads and right of ways to maintain. So we're really working hard on that for you. You have traffic signals, signs, flashers, utilities, stormwater ponds, bridges, sidewalks. You've all been seeing all the neighborhoods coming on board, all the sidewalk connections and street lights. We have about 15,000 more uh, ambulance responses than we had back in 2008. And we have an increased use in all of our parks, our libraries, the beaches. I got a crazy call in over the fourth of, or over the Memorial holiday that there were 28,000 um, people right there on the beach. And uh, so as, as citizens, I'm sure they weren't probably many of us, but there were a lot of people loving our area. It's a beautiful area. The residents and the community have done a great job making this a fantastic place to be. And so it's our responsibility as uh, the government to try to help make that easier on all the residents. I will say to you, that we have increased law enforcement to take care of this growth. This year in our 2020 budget, we're recommending new, uh, 20 new sheriff's deputies to help with law enforcement and a variety of other things. But also, um, one of the big things we're concerned about, as you know, is we had a big hurricane back in 17, Irma, and we want to plan to make sure that everyone is um, safe, and that's part of growth as well. And so we've set aside uh, recommending a $6.5 million disaster recovery um, uh, line item so that we can deal with it on a local level. That's because the population has grown so rapidly, we need to help take care of everyone. Um, I do want to also thank all of you. I want to say if you were part of the folks in favor of the infrastructure sales tax that was on the ballot in 2016, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we would not 
be handling this growth very well if that had not happened. Um, it's uh, set aside for transportation, public safety, law enforcement, parks, and community facilities. And all I'm going to say about that this, at this particular time is we have a five-year plan in that infrastructure sales tax that's about $335 million worth of improvements in just five years. So we're um, in our third year, and we are start, you're starting to see projects take, take life, impact those kinds of things. Additionally, I want to talk to you a little bit about the fact that we have a $1.5 billion capital improvement plan. And that plan has been in existence and it's a responsibility of the county to provide that. So it's been here all along. Those are the, the roads and the sidewalks and the traffic signals and all of the improvements that have been on the books for a number of years. That five-year uh, capital improvement plan also includes utilities and all the things to help you get your water turned on every morning, take a shower, flush your toilets, do everything that you're supposed to do. And that's about 648 million over the next five years. So growth has been impacted by providing additional operations and services. This is the first year as well for the, uh, the fact that we are able to add on some capacity to help serve the growth. We've been in sort of a stagnant position for the last five years, anticipating some loss in revenue due to the um, uh, uh, homestead, additional homestead exemption request. But that also narrowly failed. And so you have an additional uh, $5 million that the Board of County Commissioners has been able to put towards some of these operational requirements that will help you with growth. So. From the county perspective, I'd say um, we're, we're, our sights are set on all your growth. We're looking for the future. We have a 30-year plan called Back to the Future where we've gone around and collected information from the community. It's an ongoing process. We've been doing that for about a year. We have uh, probably around 500 to 1,000 specific comments from residents that are telling us what they want to see in the future because one thing I can say is, I know you heard I've been around the county for a while. Some people would say that you know, I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> However, I'm your public servant. I've been an employee. I've worked for the people. I work for the neighborhoods. And so um, what I want to tell you is that the last thing we want to do is plan the community for someone like me. We want to plan it for the future. We want to plan it for the people that are coming here, the, those of you that are here that are going to need to use all of our amenities, and that's what our growth plan is all about. And so thank you. Hopefully I stayed on track of my time and let my colleagues uh, add some more. So thanks. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you for staying on time. I really appreciate when people follow our time procedure. I did um, overlook the Manatee County Just for Girls Executive Director, Becky Canise. Thank you. Please give her a round of applause. And we have a representative from Senator Darrell Rusan's office to Neil Moore. Next, we have George Cruz, Principal Pursuit CRE. George is the Principal of Pursuit CRE, a real estate investment and asset management firm focused on multifamily housing. George grew up in Sarasota, relocated and settled in Manatee County in 2008. He has spent the last 20 years on finance and private equity and commercial real estate. He launched Pursuit as an advisory and finance firm and has a long-term goal of impact capital investing in the affordable workforce housing in the Manatee County and Sarasota areas. He started as an analyst with a low-income housing tax credit fund and continued efforts as a Saldowski Fund affiliate. A current member of the Manatee Chamber of Commerce's Attainable Housing Task Force and was recently reappointed to the City of Bradenton's Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. George graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in finance and an MBA with honors from the Columbia Business School, focusing on finance and real estate. 
He is a graduate of Leadership Manatee and sits on the Leadership Alumni Association Board, as well as other organizations. Please give a round of applause for George Cruz. So, so you know this is important because I never take notes for a speech, and this is the first time I've worn dress pants since <laughs> snowflake ball, so <laughs> came prepared for you guys. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, I got a phone call and was asked about being on this panel. And the first question I was asked was, am I for or against growth in Manatee County? I thought, what a strange question to have a panel on. I, I don't think I get a say in that. But if you're against growth, I wanted to help you out before I got started and give you a few suggestions on how you can keep growth down in Manatee County. First step. When you leave here, go down to Ken Burton's office. Tell him you want to double the millage rate. By doing that, you're going to keep people from moving here and buying houses. Number two, talk to Sherry. Talk to Misty. Try to get tolls on these bridges. We have nice beaches, and they're a little too accessible for the residents here. Number three, talk to Will. Thank you, Will. Tommy, everyone on the panel last month, tell them you want them to go up to Tallahassee next legislative session and try to pass a state income tax. We'll stop them right at the border. So if you want to stop growth in Manatee County, that's the way you can do it. But nobody wants that. We know it's not going to happen. So what we need to be focused on is how do we best manage growth going forward? Because if you look outside, people want to live here. We have beautiful beaches. We have great people. We've got a reasonably low cost of living. We've got zero state income tax. There's a lot of great things about Manatee County. It's why we all live here. It's why other people want to come here. And the state of Florida as a whole is the fastest growing state in the United States. And the a University of Florida survey, to go on with what Sherry was saying, predicts by 2035, Manatee County is going to grow 45%. But we have time to fix it. We have time to prepare for it. If you look since 2000, I know there's been a big growth rate in the past year or two, but since 2000, we've only grown 27%. You may think that's a lot, but it's 20th out of 67 state uh, counties in the state of Florida. We barely cracked the top third of the state of Florida in terms of growth. So we're not alone in this. We just need to make sure we're prepared. And in the past 20 years, when we had reasonable growth, we weren't properly preparing. And now we're seeing the writing on the wall. We're seeing exponential growth. And we need to come up with a solution now. So in the long term, whether it's five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 2035, we're not in the same housing situation and community situation that we're currently foreseeing. Why don't we prepare for this? I think the number one reason why we're not preparing for it is because we don't always do what's necessary for Manatee County. We're doing what's necessary for a few people that are the more vocal people within our community. We need to stop letting the voices of a few dictate the needs of the many because there's no person or group in this entire county that is more important than the overall community. We can fix these problems today with reasonable solutions, whether it be for schools, roads, or housing. But if we keep pushing this down the road, what's otherwise acceptable or tolerable solutions are going to become much more draconian when we need to fix something after the fact. If you want to see examples of this, look at Boston. They're now talking about mandatory inclusionary zoning. You look at New York, Portland, Seattle, they're either proposing or actively implementing rent control. You look at places like Minnesota, who just passed Minnesota 2040. Minnesota 2040, which was passed in December, completely abolished single family resident zoning in the entire state, making every single lot in the entire, entire state of Minnesota a minimum three unit buildable as right. So if you want to kick this down the road, by all means, kick it down the road. But right now, we can fix this with reasonable solutions. Ten years from now, this is what people are going to start seeing, because we need to house people. We need to get teachers in here. We need to get nurses in here. We need to get first responders in here. We can either prepare for it today or prepare for it in a way you're not going to like tomorrow. So what I think we need to do is we need to have these small subsets of people that don't necessarily agree with how we can fix it take a step back and understand that the community as a whole, Manatee County as a whole, is more important than some inconveniences they may have. 
whether that be small subsets that are against accessory dwelling units for the entire county, whether that be a few outspoken voices that dictate where roads go and how wide our bridges can be over Manatee River that become virtually obsolete five minutes after we cut the ribbon when a Costco goes into the south of Fort Hamner Bridge and thousands of homes go into the north of Fort Hamner Bridge and we start figuring out how we're going to deal with that traffic. Because I guarantee the same people who had the voices that kept that bridge as two lanes and are keeping the affordable housing, the accessory dwelling units, the shipping container accommodations down today are the same people who are going to be the loudest voices when they complain about the traffic down the road. They complain about the understaffed schools, the understaffed houses, and the lack of first responders 10 years from now, which we could have fixed today, but it was inconvenient today, and it's gonna be inconvenient tomorrow. So I think we need to start right now. We need to start right now. We need to do what's good for the community and not necessarily just what's good for independent people who have free time on their hands to complain about everything. And I'm gonna end with an admittedly overused but relevant pro proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. Thank you. I talk to, I try to talk to everyone when I talk about if they'll be on the panel. And I was talking to George and he was telling me some of that stuff. And I said, now make sure you say just what you told me. Because I liked it. I, I like when we come together and we might not all agree on what we should do, but the better part is that we make sure we find a solution. Please give George a round of applause. Also, I don't want to forget State Rep Will Robinson, District 71. Next, we have up Michael Neal, Land Development Manager for Neal Communities of Southwest Florida. Michael is a builder and developer who was born and raised in Bradenton. He is part of the third generation of a large locally owned home building company, currently working in a land development management role. He is the community minded and has served in various capacities on the YMCA of Manatee County Association Board the Manatee Sarasota Building Industry Association, and is currently a member of the Planning Commission of the City of Bradenton. As it relates to this month's topic, Michael believes that local governments and the community must work together to maintain and improve the quality of life for residents, while also welcoming tourists and upholding the private property rights of individuals. Please welcome Michael Neal. Thank you, Xavia, and uh, thank you, George, for uh, wading into the controversy, or at least uh, opening the door. I, um, I'm a single-family uh, home builder, you know, part of an organization that builds a lot of homes in Manatee County. So um, I think that that's who most people look, you know, look towards as far as um, the challenges our community has been facing in the last, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, <clears throat> I would say that just, you know, based on, you know, myself living in the community, um, environmental quality and, um, you know growth but in particular road congestion are probably the two biggest you know things i hear about i'm here about all the time i see county commissioners nodding so i'm sure that that's something that's on their mind but um i think i mean we have to acknowledge it's virtually indisputable that health care and you know growth the construction industry in particular um are the two biggest economic drivers in our community um i mean i, I don't have a, a ton of facts on that but i, I would say just you know, in my industry, single family homes, um, there's about 60,000 unique parts that go into every single home. And if you really break it down, there's over 100 uh, skilled trades that are involved in the construction of every home. And that goes, you know, in, in the component manufacturing. So there's a huge, it's a huge economic driver. Um, you know, when we have, you know, our political discourse, um, hopefully, at least my hope is that the political discourse takes place throughout the community at all stages, not just, you know, in the three minute public comment you know, period, yelling, screaming, et cetera, um, you know, at, at land use um, decisions. But I think um, what I want to focus for, um, focus on is that, you know, buildings change. Um, you know, Lou Holtz, a uh, famous football coach, likes to talk about whether you're a plant, or whether you're a person, or whether you're in a relationship or a community, if you're not growing, uh, you're dying. So, I mean, it's a little, little one-liner, but it, I mean, I think it has to do with growth problems. There's a lot of, um, 
communities in this country that have growth problems, and that's the Rust Belt, that's um, Flint, Michigan, that's you know Akron, Ohio, Gary, Indiana. Um, they have their their quality of life is diminishing because they can't even provide the current level of service because people are leaving. Uh, that's a lot harder of a problem to solve than the problem that we have. So um, I, I share George's optimism. I think um, we can come up with a lot of reasonable solutions. Uh, when I was you know introduced to the topic today, is growth inevitable? Um, you know. You know, like George said, we have no state income tax. We have some of the best weather in the United States, and you know, thankfully, we have a, a country where we can move, uh, you know, free country where you can move to whatever state you'd like. So, um, Florida is a very desirable state. Um, I think people, a lot of people, might look to California in the 1960s and 70s as to what Florida is right now. Um, you know, experiencing an identity crisis of sorts. Uh, California used to be a pro sprawl, pro family, low tax state everybody knows you know Ronald Reagan is from California now California is experiencing an extreme epidemic and homelessness uh, drug abuse um, I mean a real crisis um, public health crisis um, California has a median income and a lot of our median home price of over a million dollars in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles County so um, we don't want that to happen in my opinion um, also we have laws we're a nation of laws so Manti County comprehensive plan is what governs growth in Manti County uh, we are lucky to have two, you know, skilled professional planners on the county commission who have, you know, a lot of experience in, you know, what what growth management laws say. So I think, um, you know, my hope would be that we can have a sincere debate about, you know, the merits of growth and we can find ways to improve infrastructure. Um, an example of a state that's not improving their infrastructure would be New York. So New York also has 21 million people. They have double the state budget of Florida. And they're not growing, so they're not even building infrastructure. They've got, um, they've got their bridges and roads, and they're shrinking. So um, I would venture to say that Floridians are getting a lot more bang for their buck, and that's you know thanks to local government as well. But um, I mean, literally, 91 billion is the, is the state of Florida budget. Um, 180 billion is a New York budget, and New York's shrinking. Um, New York's about to lose two congressional seats in the next census, and Florida's about to gain two. So um, something I would ask, you know, ask us is, um, what is the alternative to approving? you know, new homes or new dwelling units. Well, um, in our industry, virtually all new homes are built on farmland. So looking out at a lot of y'all, you probably live on a home that was once farmland. Um, you know, the other main priority of our community is environmental quality. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, is farming a, you know, better ecological alternative to development? Um, farmers not required to treat any type of wastewater runoff. Um, just as an example, you know, Lakewood Ranch is the second fastest growing community in, in Florida and one of the top ten in the, in the nation. Lakewood Ranch in, in land area is the size of all the other municipalities in Manti County combined. Lakewood Ranch was a farm. You know, do we want a, a, a community of that size dumping phosphates and nitrates, you know, into the Manti River and the Braden River? Manti, or the Braden River runs right through Lakewood Ranch. So, um, you know, agriculture is something that is, you know, very important to the character of the state. Florida has millions of you know, the largest uh, cattle states in the nation. So I think we, um, you know, we, we like agriculture, but is it, is it, is it better for people than farming? Um, or is, is farming better than, than development, rather? Um, that's my point. And then something I, I thought about as I was preparing for this speech is, um, you know, buildings change. I was, I was in New England recently. New England has a ton of buildings that are from the colonial era that have been repurposed, churches, schools, townhomes. Um, I had dinner in what was once a townhome that's now a restaurant. It was right next to a brand new building. So um, what, we, what we want is for buildings to change. We don't want the character of the community to change. So um, New England, um, states known as the Rust Belt. Um, I was actually talking to a friend and fellow you know, millennial, if you will. Um, don't like that term, but I was talking to a millennial. And my generation doesn't even really remember the Rust Belt before when it was the Steel Belt. I mean, seriously, uh, a lot of people in this room certainly do. A lot of people in this room came from, you know, Michigan, Ohio, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. But, um, you know, they're experiencing population loss. They're experiencing quality of life decay. They have a pension crisis that's something like two-thirds of all municipalities are affected by a pension crisis. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate everyone who's here today and is civic-minded. You're obviously spending your time to come out here and have lunch and you know um, get involved. But as far as the spectrum of growth problems, we have the best type of growth problem, which is too many people wanting to come here. Um, I would say I, I looked at the same statistics that Sherry did. I mean, we've had uh, 40, 
excuse me, 129,000 people about uh, move here since 2000. Um, so that's about 46% growth. Um, have we built, you know, 46% more roads? Have we built 46% more lane miles? Have we built, you know, 46% more parks, hired law enforcement? Um, that, so that's our challenge, is to, is to uh, maintain and increase the, the standard of living. So anyway, thanks for coming out, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Please give him another round of applause. The next speaker will be Misty Servia, Manatee County Commissioner, District 4. Manatee County Commissioner Misty Servia represents District 4 and was elected in November of 2018. Misty Servia is a graduate of Florida State University and a professional planner certified in the profession with 30 years of planning experience. Her planning experience, both to the private and public sectors, provides her with a unique vision of our development needs and challenges. While campaigning, she heard the frustrations of residents who lived in a high growth community and promised to create a way to allow the citizens to offer ideas to our growth challenges. That group was established shortly after her election and is known as the District 4 Citizens Coalition on Growth. The group meets monthly to discuss growth-related topics and offer input from a citizen's perspective to the Board of County Commissioners. Ms. Servia is the first in her family to graduate from college and funded her education through scholarships, grants, and by working three part-time jobs while in school. Outside of college, she has lived in the area her entire life. She has immersed herself in public service throughout her career. Please welcome Commissioner Misty Servia. Thank you, Extavia. And thank you, Tiger Bay. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I just crossed off a bunch of stuff since you read it in and my bio, so my, my presentation just got shorter. So I thought that I would talk about traffic today. Does anybody like traffic congestion? <laughs> oh good, I picked the right subject. Okay, so I have to start off with a disclaimer. I'm not a traffic engineer, nor do I mean to insult any traffic engineers. So please, Marla, that means you, and others. I'm sure there's others in here. So for decades, um, we have relied on our cars, especially in Florida, and we have this auto-dependent land use, these land use trends that I think we need to offset. And I think the single biggest thing that we can do is to strongly incentivize mixed-use development. So you've heard the statistics, you know, think about it. Florida's already the third largest state in America. We're growing by near, nearly 1,000 new residents every single day. We have 21 million people in Florida, and we're gonna grow by five million more by the year 2030. By then, we'll have three million more drivers on our roads, 50 million more visitors, and Manatee County's population is gonna surpass Sarasota's in the year 2035, if not before. So now is the time to think about how we're planning for our future and what we need to change or shift in our approach to traffic. So that's where planning and land use comes in, in my mind anyway. So community design is strongly related to traffic. A few more stats. One out of six of us commutes 45 minutes to work, and that was me before I was elected. 60% of our vehicle trips are one mile or less. And get this, a 23-minute commute has the same effect on our happiness as a 19% reduction in our salary. Okay, so pretty interesting. Um, so some ideas on traffic. I didn't wanna just complain, I wanted to tell you some ideas I had because when I was out there campaigning, I heard a lot about growth and traffic. You heard I established the Citizens Coalition on Growth. I'm very excited that that group meets monthly and they brainstorm ideas and they think about things that the rest of us aren't thinking about. And just as a little advertisement, anybody who lives in District 4 may be interested in joining that group, see me after this meeting. 
Okay, let's start with complete streets. Manatee County's already doing that. I'm so proud of Manatee County for doing that. What is a complete street? A complete street is designed for all sorts of different ways of transportation, whether it be cars, people, pedestrians, um, bicycles, transit, and for all different types of abilities. And that includes our handicapped residents. So Manatee County is already do doing that. Hooray. Let's talk about schools. I grew up in Sarasota. When I went to school, I rode the bus every single day. How many people rode the bus to school? Right? Most of us? Okay. I have three kids. My kids have never rode the bus to school. Not because I don't want them to. We happened to live within two miles of a school and they weren't eligible to ride the bus. So every day I had to adjust my work schedule around my kids who had to go to school and make sure that I dropped them off along with it seemed like thousands of other parents doing the same thing. And now we have school choice. So if you live in Lakewood Ranch and you have a child and you want them to go to Anna Maria Elementary, fabulous school, you can do it. All you gotta do is fill out the paperwork. So there's lots of people doing that. Lots of parents making choices, lots of parents driving all over to take their kids to school. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but hasn't the traffic improved dramatically since school got out, right? You can get over the bridge. There's no, there's no problem. I mean, I, I found no problem in traffic. So I think that we have some real opportunities when it comes to transporting our children to school. How about if instead of transporting kids that lived within two miles of schools, we said, we'll do it within one mile. If you live within one mile of schools, we'll transport you to school. Okay, what's that gonna take? More buses, right? More bus drivers, we already have a shortage of those. But when you compare it to the $12 million per mile to build a roadway, I think we can buy a lot of school buses and pay our school bus drivers. So just a thought. Um, let's talk about business owners. And I'm so glad that Jackie is here and our chamber friends are here. Because I think that there's a real opportunity for our largest employers to incentivize their employees to do something different when it comes to getting to work. You know, how about encouraging those who can to work from home? How about off-peak hours? So not everybody's going to work at 8 and everybody's coming home at 5. You know, we live in a society now where you can do work at Starbucks. I do it all the time. Um, you don't necessarily have to go to work at 8 and have to come home at 5 for everyone. Now, of course, we still have employees that need to do that. But I think that if we started establishing carpools and maybe even partnering with our largest employers to work on housing near the uh, employer, that, you know, we might be able to get a lot of cars off the road. Affordable housing, that's right, we need affordable housing. Everybody knows we need affordable housing. Um, we need it everywhere. I talked to a guy who called me last week and he said he's thinking of moving to Sebring so he can keep his job here. What? <laughs> so we have got to find ways to build affordable housing. Everybody's heard about walkable communities, right? It's a buzzword. We all want to achieve walkable communities. So stepping outside just today in the 100 degree weather, you will notice that it's a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> to walk places, right? But here's what we can do. If we start requiring that we plant more trees along our walkways and our sidewalks, all of a sudden we have a more pleasant way to get around and walk around. I live within a couple blocks of a grocery store. I mean, I would gladly, if it was a safe and comfortable walk, I would walk there to get a gallon of milk. And I think a lot of people would. Here's the problem, and it's my engineer friends, again. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> oh my God, I have so much more to say. But so what we can do is we can, there are ways to plant trees next to sidewalks. Do they interfere with utilities? Yes. Will they crack the sidewalks? Yes. But there's ways around that. It just takes a little ingenuity, maybe a little bit more money, but we can achieve what we need to achieve. Okay. That's it. I've been timed out. Thank you, Misty. I'm sorry you ran out of time. It was a really good presentation, though. Thank you so much. 
Now it's time for our questions and answers. Okay, to ask a question, you must be a member of the Manatee Tiger Bay Club. To become a member, all we need is $100. You may see Elaine. Elaine, raise your hand. There she is. Members, to allow everyone a chance to ask a question, you are limited to only 30 seconds. Please do not elaborate. All we need is your question. I need you to state your name. I need you to let us know that you're a member and you need to ask who you would like to answer your question, please. And we have our usher right there, Steve. He will usher you back if you're over your 30 seconds. Very nicely though. Okay, let's go. First question. Missy says she can talk more. <laughs> Come on and line up over here with your questions, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ooh, $100, all right. Thank you so much. So well worth it. Your name, please. My name is Glenn Jablina, community activist, affordable hey. housing advocate. This is for Michael. So. As I, as I follow your construction along and talk to uh, different folks, why is it none of your communities have affordable housing? So let me just give you an example that, you know, people for entry level service people, police officers, EMS, they can't afford to live in your communities. What are you doing to help that? Okay, great question. Um, so affordable housing, so obviously, Everyone wants to own a home. Everyone wants their home to be affordable. Um, the price of a home is a function of the cost of a home. And um, the construction costs, the land costs um, have risen, just like in California where I mentioned uh, San Francisco and you know Los Angeles, the median home price is a million dollars. So that's because the land has gone up in value. So if people wanted to snap their fingers, for example, and you know demand <clears throat> that developers you know, build affordable housing, which is admirable. Um, what developers would have to do is, of course, raise the price of some homes to subsidize, you know, a below market uh, return on other homes. But uh, something that is interesting, too, is the single largest input cost of um, a home in Manatee County is impact fees. So about $21,000, about 6000 for, um, you know, utilities, uh, road impact fees, and um, school impact fees, about $8,000. So, um, you know, only about, I think it's 7% of all home sales are new homes. Um, so, you know, only those 7% of new homes pay impact fees. Um, you know, used homes, people who buy used homes also send their kids to school. So what we do is we have a policy that amounts to a um, selective tax on, you know, less than 10% of all, all new homes. So I would say, um, you know, your question's well uh, put. I think a lot of people share your concern, but it's economics and it's a function of the cost. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Bob McKay, and first I'd like to give a compliment to the county administrator and her, um, uh, the person who I think controlled the signal lights or something. But as I drove here today, <laughs> as I drove here today, I was thinking to myself, you know, the signals are beautifully synchronized. The traffic is flowing so beautifully. And so whoever designed that has, deserves a compliment. I didn't know that I would be able to do this here. So, um, but I do have a question, and it has to do with um, it has to do with uh, um, storms and stormwater systems. And I noticed in the presentation there was not a lot of attention given to water, water quality, wastewater, and so on. Our stormwater system seems to be obsolete. We've had a lot of flooding. And uh, the recent 2017 storm was probably a 100-year storm, but these storms are happening a lot more often than 100 years. So my question is, what are your plans for dealing with these 100-year storms that seem to be occurring maybe every decade? Thank you. Who's your question for? Uh, County Administrator. County Administrator. Thank you very much. First, thanks for complimenting our Traffic Management Center. It's over in the public safety complex, and it's something that was instituted uh, a number of years ago. And in fact, it, it has 
has uh, several dedicated individuals every day watching all of the traffic lights. It's coordinated with um, the Florida Department of Transportation and also with Sarasota County. So it's uh, it's over there in that building and it's, uh, it's the room as big as this with uh, every, every um, traffic signal that we have uh, video on, so thank you. Um, everybody always teases me, if I can get from here to the airport in 12 minutes, I must have something special on top of my car that, that they know, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> um, good point about stormwater. Um, you're right on target with that topic. Our Board of County Commissioners has had five work sessions in the last four months on that topic. Um, one of the things that was discussed about impact fees relates to it too. Here in Manatee County, we don't have a very diverse revenue source. Um, in many, many counties, you'll see a stormwater fee for stormwater impacts. This is something I will have to say we're looking into. We've spent a number of months looking over all of this. We have our commissioners looking at it. It's something that we've tried to make public. We'll be bringing it back to the public in more detail in the fall, and um, we're going to try to wrap that discussion up by um, November because that is a very important topic. Water quality is another issue we're dealing with right now in the storm in 17 created quite a bit of concern. But a lot of the things that you're seeing happening are natural things that happen. You're just seeing a more strong and evident um, source of it because in fact you are out. It's walkable communities. We have everyone out at the beaches, the preserves. Um, we've done some testing here recently. We've just sent that off to the state and also we're working with um, DEP on making sure that we know what's going on. So I don't have a lot of answers for you today on our current stormwater quality as of right now, but it is a big issue that we're working on as well as that stormwater revenue area. Thanks, hopefully that answers some of it. Good afternoon, Jackie Dazelski. I am a member of Tiger Bay. Talking a lot about residential growth, it seems like most of the commentary focused on that, but obviously a natural outgrowth of that is business growth as well. Could either Misty or Sherry comment a, a bit on business attraction and job opportunities that we are looking to attract? The county has a tremendous partnership with the EDC and with the chamber in helping um, incentivize uh, job growth as well, but that's gotta be a natural outcropping of residential growth as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll address that. Uh, we do, we have great partnership on economic development. Really, um, and I just thought when Jackie mentioned this, we um, went to our board back in 2008 and created an economic development incentive program. I think that's about in line with some of the growth here, but it's an attraction, it's an incentive service that tries to attract high paying, um, high skilled jobs. And we work directly with the Bradenton area EDC on that. Um, in conjunction with that though, I wanted to mention we have Livable Manatee, um, which is an incentive for affordable housing. And I'd say that you know, when um, Michael was speaking, one of the things that we could ask of our developers more is to take advantage of a small percentage of affordable housing in each one of their developments. If they're having issues with those impact fees, they can look at that Livable Manatee program. Um, our economic development, though, is to try to attract skilled workers to make our businesses thrive. And I think the Chamber and our EDC have done a great job of outreach, um, it's, we've become, a, a, again, a very popular place due to the great environment and just great people. Everybody always says, what's the difference between Manatee County and other counties? It, it's, it's, all, it's everybody just rolls their sleeves up and gets down to business and gets work done, and I think that's another attractor. So we're um, looking at um, wages that are at 115% above the median, and that's what our incentive goes to. And we've got a lot of opportunity out in our North County area where the port is. I put a plug in for the fact that over the next six months, you'll see a North, uh, North County plan come back where we've done some more look at what kind of business could be brought out there. Hopefully I touched some of it, Jackie. So. Thank you. Renee, did you have a question? Okay. I'm just the 
Hi, I'm Rosalie Schaefer, and I'm a member. I've got a question for Ms. Coria or anyone else who would like to respond. Is the ideal it, to have the infrastructure in before major developments go in? Because uh, we use this as an example, 60th Avenue in Ellington, where major large developments are being approved before that intersection, which is already really overused, is um, you know improved. Great question again, and yes, it is. And when I said thank you, thank you, thank you for the infrastructure sales tax, that's the reason that we can actually put money towards those larger um, improvements. But that project in and of itself is, is a collaboration. Um, hopefully this isn't new news to you, but there's gonna be a new um, interchange. It's gonna be redone out there. And um, so we're working in conjunction with the Florida Department of Transportation to bring all those improvements to that area and to 60th Avenue um, in trying to do that in conjunction with the growth that's happened out in the eastern part of the parish and Ellington and Palmetto area. One other thing for Misty can come up and address this too is we put a considerable, um, well, it is probably the most considerable project is the 44th Avenue extension. And that extension will run all the way from the western border to the eastern border. And that has been a primary uh, goal of the board. Um, it's about $180 million project total. Um, we're so excited we just received some support from the state for that, a $10 million um, contribution to that project, but that is another advanced effort to try to ease traffic congestion for both, to, uh, both um, I-75 and all of your other connectors. Misty. Thank you. I just wanted to add a little bit of information to that. So it's always important to remember, because I get this question a lot, um, that there are state laws that govern how we build our roadways and, and how we build infrastructure in general. So take schools, for example. We can't build a school and hope that the kids will come. We build schools in response to overcrowded schools. The same with roadways. Um, and how are roadways primarily funded? Impact fees is a big part of it. And impact fees are paid after the development comes in. One more thing when you think about 60th Avenue over by the outlet mall, and I get stuck in that intersection all the time. Let's say that a new business goes in there. Let's say that we have a new hat shop. Okay, the new hat shop is gonna be studied for the amount of traffic that they are gonna to bring to that facility. Um, they are not responsible for all of the cars that are on the road from, you know, from years past. They are responsible for their traffic and that's what state law says and that's what they have to mitigate. So traffic congestion, yes, it's a big problem and I think we need to really focus on urban planning in our community and start planning um, you know, very walkable and, and mixed-use neighborhoods so that we don't have so many people that have to drive to the outlet mall to go shopping. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Ken Piper, and I am a member. Um, I think a lot of the frustration that many of us have over development is that we don't think we have any serious input into the process. Uh, there was a recent uh, decision involving Aqua by the Bay in which the uh, uh, court stated that uh, members of the public have no standing to appeal the decisions of the county commissioners. Uh, they have no right to be represented by an attorney and they have no right to have their own expert witnesses present and examine the plans of the developers. I'm wondering, and the question's for all of you, I'm wondering if you would favor an amendment to the Land Development Code to permit the public to have that type of input, and if you can't do that, would you be willing to go to Mr. Robinson and ask him to change the Florida statute so they can? Yeah, this is the one I get, of course. <laughs> I don't get the water one. Um, I, I can see what you're saying, and I don't disagree with it. And I think if somebody was coming and asking for a meaningful change in zoning or a meaningful change in what they're intending to do with the land, then by all means, everyone should have an input in it because it's all of our community. But 
when you're, do, when you're building something by right, when you're building something that's already within the zoning code, then to have people after the fact say, I don't want you to do what you're allowed to do with your private land, just doesn't to me make sense. It may make sense to other people if different people have different opinions. But if I went and found a, a commercial property and said, I want to put single family homes there, or if I found a single family home property in my neighborhood and said, I want to put a gas station, by all means, everyone should have a say in it. And by all means, everyone, that should be shot down. But if I'm buying something with my money, buying at a fair market value to do what I knew I was allowed to do before I bought it, then I don't see where the argument can be unless I want changes. And if I want changes, I have to be willing to accept the fact there's going to be a public hearing and there's going to be discussions about it. But if I don't want those discussions, if I want to avoid those discussions, then don't change the plan. Do what you're allowed to do. Because buy right development is one of the easiest ways to limit the cost of construction. Yeah, and thank you for your question. I do have a quick point, too. And I'm, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, two of our commissioners are planners. Um, Growth management law, major, uh, major amendment was in 1984, so the future uh, land use map, or, you know, or the comprehensive plan, is basically the legal standard which determines future land use. Um, the uh, community you spoke about was within the density of the future of the comprehensive plan. Uh, there were certain um, restrictions, you know, there were certain specific elements that the developer sought to waive, but um, almost every development has a small waiver of some sort. So. It's all a matter of degree, I mean, but for example, even a residential development, you may want to um, waive a buffer by five feet or you may want to waive, you know, a gate requirement or, or so. So, um, you know, unfortunately, the zoning process is a quasi-judicial quasi process, which has certain due process. Um, I think there's a lot of frustration from the public, and unfortunately, I would say they're, they're upset about the result. Um, so, I mean, what I would say is if you don't like, you know, the law, then you have to change the law. You can't. Um, you know, basically smear the elected officials who, um, you know, voted or interpreted the comprehensive plan in the way that they felt was, was in accordance with the law. Um, so, you know, controversial waterfront developments, change is hard. Um, kind of like what I said in my speech, you know, you go to towns in all throughout America, um, the buildings change, housing stock becomes obsolete, we need new dwelling units. Um, we should focus on, you know, changing the comprehensive plan if we don't like the density, so that's my opinion, but thank you. I got 30 seconds. Ken, thank you for your question. So in 30 seconds, I will say public engagement is so important. I've always advocated for that. I will continue to advocate for that because when you bring everybody together in the process, the process works. And we just had a hearing in Board of County Commissioners not too long ago talking about ADUs. And I said to the audience, isn't this a great process? Because everybody was heard, and in the end, when you do that, I think it, you always come out with a better project. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone who has attended our lunching today. That will be the end of our questions. Do we have a tiger by the tail? Yes, we do. The winner of Tiger by the Tail Award for the most interesting question is Ken Piper. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers that came out today, County Administrator Sherry Correa, George Cruz, Michael Neal, and County Commissioner Misty Servia. Please give them another round of applause. Thanks to our Board of Directors and Program Committee. Just stand to be recognized really quick, please, if you're here. Thank you so much. Our next luncheon will be held on Thursday, July 18th. The topic, the future of animal welfare in Manatee County. Members and guests, if you know someone who might be interested in upcoming topics, please invite them as your guests. Members, we offer you an option to submit question and answers online if you would like to. You can go to www.manateetigerbay.org. If you are interested in a topic and speakers you would like to hear from, please contact Elaine at Elaine at Manatee Tiger Bay. Pier 22 provides our complimentary valet parking for our luncheons. We thank the following news media for coverage of the luncheon, Charles Clapsaddle and METV crew. Thank you very much. 
Their website is at metweb.com. We have ABC7 WWSB team for attending. Please give them a round of applause. We also have the coverage from Bradenton Herald and Herald Tribune. Thank you so much to come out this evening. Please have a great evening. Thank you.